My head used to be full of the ideas I learned in school and from the news. I wanted to make things better, but I didn't really understand the depth of social problems. If we want to solve poverty, I thought, we should have a government ministry dedicated to it, or encourage charity. If we want to preserve the environment, we should find a way to create financial incentives to doing it. If we have noisy neighbors, we should call the police. These are all indirect solutions that would require other people to act in my interest, when they don't really have to do what I want. They might solve the problem for me their way, and they might make it worse. But what if there are simpler, direct ways to solve these problems? And if there are, why do we never even consider them? On this channel, I use various approaches to explain systems of power. In this video, I'm going to propose what I think are obvious solutions to social problems, and we'll see if we can figure out why they haven't been implemented. I'm Chris, and this is what had to be said. This video was sponsored by Google, Amazon, and Meta. Because, hey, they own the internet now. Why continue to resist, humans? <laughs> anyway, I believe we were looking for solutions. Let's start with war. It's a big problem. I don't think you can solve this kind of problem without knowing the cause. There are many causes of war you could point to if you were writing a book, like territorial expansion, replacing a recalcitrant government with a puppet, opening up markets, diverting attention from domestic problems. But the short answer to why rulers start wars is because they can. You'll notice the people who start wars are always people who have power who want more power. Politics and war are kind of the same thing that way. Some people are trying to impose their will on others. War just means the others are putting up a fight. To me, the obvious solution to war would be to never let people gather enough power to be able to start a war. This video isn't about how to do that. It's about why obvious solutions are not obvious to everyone. But I do think it's what we should be talking about. Ending the capacity to wage war is a long-term solution to war, possibly the only one. How could you go to war without a military, without a treasury, without huge amounts being spent on the most killingest technology. Now, there were wars or violence that could be called war in places that had not yet been conquered by a state. But modern war is not some tribal feud that can be ended with a marriage. Modern war is a tool of the modern state. It's characterized by legions of men with rifles, tanks to crush the land and the people on it, and jets to incinerate them from the sky. Millions of dead bodies and millions more refugees, mass imprisonment, torture, the threat of nuclear annihilation, and endless propaganda to make it all seem normal and necessary. I think we should make all those things impossible. You could, in theory, end them all in one stroke by ending the state and vigilantly preventing the re-emergence of concentrated power. I suggest it here not just because I think it would be a worthwhile long-term goal, but because I want to illustrate what causes these problems and prevents us from solving them. The state can't be eliminated immediately. How would you do it? I don't know anyone who proposes that. But I do think we should all be asking, how can we work toward digging up the root of all these problems? 
but we're not asking those questions. Instead, we ask how to get our favorite party elected, how many letters to write to them to get them to do something for us, what to do about people who don't follow every law or pay the state the amount of money it demands, how to make things better without actually changing anything. <clears throat> we can solve our problems, it's just there's something standing in our way. Most of us never learn to see the extent to which social problems are caused by power. The state is the concentration of power. And the thing about power is, if you have power over others, they necessarily don't have freedom. Using power means using it against people. It means if you're under someone's power and you don't like the way things are, too bad, because it's not up to you. It means some people can live a life of luxury while others spend all day working for them. The powerful have an incentive to keep people ignorant, divided, and working all the time, so they can't think about and change their situation. The institutions of power keep us ignorant and racist and stressed out and poor. The solution to all those problems is to get rid of their causes and get rid of the state. Concentrating power means organizing people whose job it is to do violence. No one person or a small group of people could defend themselves against it indefinitely. The state claims a monopoly on the means of violence and on propaganda, so it makes itself appear eternal and indestructible. But it's not. It has weaknesses, and the more people realize we don't need it, the more people will resist. Most problems don't have such obvious solutions, of course, and even these raise obvious questions. What matters is how we perceive the problem. The questions we ask and the approaches we take to answering them are what lead us to a logical solution. If you ask, what's to be done about crime? I'd say you're asking the wrong question. Crime is too many different things to be inherently wrong or in need of one solution. If you really cared about crime, the obvious solution would be to just make everything legal. But surely the real problem is voluntary acts that harm others, like killing. So you could ask, how do we stop killing? But most people are okay with killing in the right circumstances, especially if they're scared or hungry. So maybe the problem is unnecessary, unprovoked violence, not crime. Great, now we can talk about solutions. But they're not obvious to me, so another time. However many years I've been alive is the number of years I've heard people in Canada, the US, and the UK complain about staffing shortages, especially in hospitals. All the problems doctor and nurse shortages have, have, can cause have been magnified since the start of the COVID pandemic. We've heard about the incredible amount of stress medical staff have been putting up with, and it's not surprising many of them have left the profession. Well, there's a really obvious solution to all of it. Immigration. There are plenty of either fully trained doctors and nurses or people eager to learn how to be all over the world. They can help out, take some of the load off, but they're not allowed in. Well, a few of them are, but even then they're tied up in red tape for years before they can practice. Every so often, policymakers even float the idea of paying citizens to reproduce. It all follows the logic of modern border enforcement. Only let a tiny percentage of the people in who want to come in, then wring your hands about staffing crises and birth rates. Freedom, including the freedom of movement, would solve a lot of problems. That said, obvious solution, obvious problem. If, if we just let a billion people into any country, but 
kept the current system the same, it would cause all kinds of problems. But it's not because of some natural fact about irreconcilable cultures and the inevitability of clashes between them. It's because this system of power we all live under incentivizes promoting racism and other divisions. It makes access to the things we, we need scarce because it depends on corporations or governments to provide them and they control things to their benefit, not that of the people they rule. So surely the obvious solution would be to get rid of that system. How? Again, that's another question. Ask me in the comments if you like, we can talk about it, but I hope the why is getting clearer. There are currently tens of millions of refugees who need somewhere to go. They're not all Ukrainian. And I should probably add, refugee is mostly a legal designation. And there are many more who want or need to leave, but are blocked from entering anywhere. Any country that's big enough could fit them all. People would ask, where are we going to put them all? But they're still thinking in terms of the complicated, self-interested, indirect system of the state. They're not Lego blocks. You don't have to put them anywhere. Let them in. They won't concentrate in the same place. They'll find families, friends, and cultural brethren. They need homes. They can build them. They bring skills with them. They'll set up their own communities. They'll become self-sufficient. You don't need a central authority to monitor and restrict them and control their movement just because they're designated refugees. Under the current system, 45,000 people trying to get to Europe have died or disappeared, i.e. been trafficked, just trying to cross the Mediterranean. And possibly twice that many trying to cross the Sahara. Many unofficial EU border guard militias are involved in human trafficking and have been known to torture migrants in concentration camps in places like Libya operated under EU border policy. The EU has budgeted 754 million euros for border security in 2022. I guess that's the one thing they can agree on. And how does it benefit you? It just makes it harder for you to go anywhere. Are you that desperate to avoid contact with people from different cultures, which is not a problem unless you make it a problem? But in a system that pays people handsomely for stirring up bigotry, it gets turned into a problem. Human trafficking would diminish considerably in the absence of borders, as people would no longer have to make deals with the mafia just to get across. The whole problem of illegal immigration, which by the way, isn't a problem, would disappear. Moreover, I don't see how we could still have famines, or at least on the scale we have today, if people could move around the world freely. Wherever there's a famine, people go like, oh, it's, it's tragic, it's so sad, so they write a check and give it to someone who they assume will use it to solve the problem. They don't need to follow up the next year and ask if the money has actually gone to the people it was promised to. The act of signing the check made them feel good. Why go through such an indirect, convoluted path to helping people? Because we've put up walls to them, and we only want to feed them through a tiny slot in the wall. Because we're empaths and humanitarians. We're, we're very kind, charitable people, usually. We just don't want those people anywhere near us. And if that means they have to die or get sold into slavery, too bad for them. But why not eliminate borders and let hungry people go to where the food is? There's enough food in the world to feed everyone. But for various avoidable reasons, it doesn't get to everyone. Borders are just one of those reasons, of course. After all, there might be people where you live who don't have enough food. Why? Why doesn't everyone have enough food? It's not that complicated, actually. Instead of being grown so everyone could live and be healthy, food is produced for profit. 
because everything is subjected to the market, including the things we need. There are plenty of obvious solutions to hunger, since the food is there, on the ground, and in the supermarket. If people are hungry, just let them eat. But then police will come and stop them, because police defend owners and their property, even if it means people go hungry. And borders are just property claims writ large. The owners of property created legal regimes that enshrined property as an inviolable right to be enforced by organized violence. As a result, the ideology that property is sacrosanct has spread among people all over the world, to the point that people will make up their own excuses for it. There's always a reason not to feed people, like you're encouraging laziness and free riders, capitalism is efficient, and so on, but what it all amounts to is you're not allowed to eat unless you have money. Would you say that to a person's face? Or would you just give them some of your food? Hungry people can't take food that's right there, even if it's going to rot without going to prison. If people are hungry, you don't need to take a course on economics or set up an interdepartmental inquiry. Just let them take food. Asking why people don't have enough food is almost the same as asking why they don't have homes. After all, like food, shelter is right there. How would you solve the problem of homelessness? Well, have you tried giving people homes? There are homes that are empty, maybe because they haven't been sold or rented out yet. Why not just let people stay there? How about hotel rooms not being used, or offices and stores after they close for the night? Why isn't that allowed? Short answer, the private ownership of land. But keep asking why. Keep pulling that thread, because you'll learn all about the system it was knitted into. What happened to their homes? Why can't they have new ones? Why can't they stay somewhere warm when it's not occupied? I say these solutions should be obvious, but they aren't. And it's not because people aren't smart enough to figure them out. The reason they're not obvious is ideology. Some ideologies can clarify and cut through, but dominant ideologies are created through propaganda to serve the ruling class. Ideology can complicate and obscure simple matters, making them seem like something only a team of experts with unlimited resources could figure out. But that's because they assume the obvious solutions are impossible. All the supposed complicated solutions to social problems are actually ways to avoid solving them. If you wanted to solve them, you could do it yourself, or with the people around you, and the people affected by the problem. Working through the system is, is an extremely long, costly, indirect, uphill route to solving a problem, and if the people in the system have no interest in your solution, it won't get implemented. Direct action, on the other hand, is how people get things done. My point in this video is not that solving these problems is easy, but that it would be much easier if there weren't so many artificial constraints, like war and prisons and laws and borders and red tape. We could just share land and food, but instead they have to be subjected to market forces. We could solve famine, poverty, and labor shortages in one fell swoop by eliminating borders. But we're told every day to go through the proper channels, to let authority decide what to do, to assume this system will last in perpetuity and will meet all our needs. If you say the system works, maybe it just works for you. It doesn't work for the victims of racism, poverty, or war. And if you can think of ways to solve those problems in the presence of a system that perpetuates them, let me know. That's all for this week. Here are some of the videos I wanted to make before I broke my pen.